Cunard had its premier three-ship weekly service between Liverpool and New York. The ships were all grand, popular, and reliable. It was a balanced trio. And to top it all off, Cunard was the first to achieve this elusive feat. But this would not be an ocean liner history video if a wrench didn't get thrown into the gears at some point, and alas, World War I put a pause on Cunard's dominant money-making operation. Just a couple of months after she was delivered to Cunard, Aquitania was taken away. She was requisitioned by the Admiralty on August 7, 1914, to serve as an armed merchant cruiser. If you're a regular viewer of this channel, you know how the story goes with armed merchant cruisers in World War I. Not well. The Admiralty quickly learned that its original plan for the fast Cunarders and other British liners was not practical, but not before Aquitania collided with the Leyland liner, Canadian. The Admiralty considered handing Aquitania back over to Cunard following their realization that armed merchant cruisers were not feasible, but they decided to lay her up instead pending a final decision. Ultimately, Aquitania and Mauritania were both converted to troop ships and were used in the Gallipoli campaign, a much better use of the strength of the Great Liners. As the Gallipoli campaign failed and the casualties mounted, both ships were converted to hospital ships and were painted in the iconic white, red, and green livery, meant to give them certain legal protections from attack. By now, Aquitania had already served the Admiralty during the war in three capacities as an armed merchant cruiser, as a troop ship, and as a hospital ship. But the messiness of war and bureaucracy ensured that the ship would be converted several more times by the war's end. After Gallipoli, the Admiralty was so sure that it would not need Aquitania's services again, what led to this conclusion, I'm not sure, that they paid Cunard for the cost to convert her back to a civilian configuration. Of course, they did need her again, and paid yet again to convert Aquitania back to a hospital ship at a total cost of £90,000. In November 1916, Aquitania encountered a severe storm on a return voyage from the Mediterranean, causing significant damage and necessitating repairs and delaying her next voyage. In her stead, Britannic sailed for the Mediterranean and ultimately struck a mine and sank on what was supposed to be Aquitania's voyage. Due to the increased aggression of Germany's feared U-boats, Aquitania was laid up for several months before returning to service in November 1917 again as a troop ship. This time, she was painted with a novel dazzle paint scheme, designed to confuse potential combatants. She helped carry American troops to Europe, the United States having recently entered the war. In October 1918, Aquitania was sailing in a convoy and carrying 6,000 American troops when the helm of the destroyer USS Shaw became stuck, causing the American ship to veer into the path of Aquitania. The Shaw was sliced open, killing 12 Americans, but somehow managed to remain afloat. Once the armistice was signed, ending the war, Aquitania was released back to Cunard, but was then subsequently chartered by the British government to repatriate Canadian troops. She retained her dazzle paint for some time while bringing Canadians home via Halifax. By the summer of 1919, Aquitania was completely done with her World War I service and was in dire need of a refit, having spent her first few years in wartime service. This refit included her conversion from being a coal-fired ship to being an oil-fired ship. This would have greatly reduced her labor costs, as well as her susceptibility to service interruptions caused by labor strikes, as well as reducing the length of the turnaround process between voyages. You might also notice that the appearance of Aquitania's bridge was different by the end of the war than it was at the start of her career. In fact, Aquitania's bridge design changed several times throughout her career, to the point where, from some angles, she looked like an entirely different ship from her original design. For the sake of time, I won't go into the details of that here, but it is very interesting, and I have a great quick move video on this very topic for my supporters on Patreon. The conversion from coal to oil also resulted in the conversion of her original anti-rolling tanks to oil tanks. The anti-rolling tanks were a novelty at the time, and were an alternative to the traditional bilge keels used to reduce lateral rolling at sea. They weren't quite as effective as first thought though, and those tanks were deemed better used for fuel storage. Luckily, Aquitania had been designed with bilge keels as a possibility, and was easily fitted with them instead. Even though Aquitania missed out on what could have been her prime years of commercial service, she did quite well in the years following World War I, despite having to compete with the newer liners as they were introduced. And although she lost her running mate, Lusitania, during the war, 
Cunard received the huge German liner Imperator as a reparation. Imperator was renamed Berengaria, and her 24 knot service speed meant that she could keep up with Aquitania and Mauritania. The White Star Line did not fare quite as well as Cunard in this regard, with the loss of both Titanic and Britannic. In the mid-1920s, Aquitania, like many other ships, saw the introduction of tourist third class, which would replace second class as passenger demographics changed in this decade. With a shift away from immigrant traffic in the 1920s, the tourist third class, later to be renamed to just tourist class, aimed to do what the name suggested, attract holiday goers or other travelers who were on a budget, but would expect more than third class had to offer. Aquitania attracted everyone, including the rich and famous, including people like F. Scott Fitzgerald and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Aquitania pleased even them. Famed and tragic explorer Sir Ernest Shackleton, for example, said that he was spoiled by Aquitania's luxury. These were Aquitania's golden years, and she was loved by everyone who stepped aboard, even when she gave them a rough ride. And there were plenty of times when Aquitania had to prove her worth at sea including when she sailed through a hurricane off the European coast, forcing her to slow down to a speed of just four knots. Despite the caution of the crew, portholes were still smashed and public spaces flooded. Aquitania was relatively comfortable and steady, even in rough conditions, though. Unlike Lusitania and Mauritania, Aquitania was what they called a dry ship, because she was designed to ride over the waves rather than plow through them. And in this way, she yet again proved to be more similar to Olympic and Titanic than her own running mates. This was achieved by the shape of the bow and allowed for a more comfortable ride. When Prohibition took effect in the United States in 1920, it was not immediately clear whether or not foreign flag ships such as Aquitania could even carry a liquor into an American port. Thus, there was some confusion as to how or if Aquitania could even serve alcohol aboard when transiting the Atlantic. This, of course, was more than a small problem to both passengers and Cunard, which earned extra revenue from alcohol sales. During this period of uncertainty, an experimental soda fountain was installed in the garden lounge as a sort of alternative. The chief purser was very skeptical of the viability of this endeavor, and as it turned out, he was right to be, since the soda fountain was not only a failure, but apparently an insult to the taste of Cunard's customers. The soda fountain was promptly removed upon arrival after just one crossing. Thankfully, it was determined that British ships could carry liquor into American ports, provided that it was securely locked up upon arrival in port. Longtime captain of Aquitania, Sir James Charles, was set to retire at the end of a July 1928 voyage. He had reached Cunard's mandatory retirement age of 63 years old. It apparently broke his heart to have to retire, though, because he collapsed right after giving control over to the pilot at the end of the voyage. Aquitania raced into Southampton to try to save her captain, but it was too late, and Captain Charles passed away before seeing a moment of what retirement had to offer. Maybe he had no interest in giving it a shot. The passing of Captain Charles was perhaps the symbolic end of Aquitania's golden years. In the early 1930s, Aquitania dipped her toe into the cruising market. Cunard tried to send her on a, quote, cruise to nowhere from New York but it proved to be unpopular, and they subsequently scheduled her for a three-day trip to Bermuda from New York, which was successful. I've been on a couple of Bermuda cruises, and a three-day round trip does seem quick, so I guess Aquitania didn't dawdle in order to drag out the length of the cruise. She later did cruises to other places, including Halifax, Nova Scotia, in the summer where she was popular and profitable, but inconsistently so. Since it was assumed, rightly so, that only the middle class and up could afford to go on a cruise, the barriers between the classes were lifted, and all public spaces were open to everyone. As such, thrifty passengers would book a cruise in the second-class cabin and have the same access as anyone else, aside from taking meals in the second-class dining saloon. On April 10, 1935, Aquitania was returning from a cruise in the Mediterranean. As she navigated the infamous Esther on approach to Southampton, a gust of wind grabbed hold of her and put her aground on a mud bank. With eight tugs on the scene and the tide receding, it became evident that this was going to be a drawn-out affair, and almost all of the passengers were taken ashore via tender. Ultimately, after multiple cycles of the tide, Aquitania was finally pulled out of the mud, but repairs were necessary and the ship's schedule was greatly disrupted. In 1937, Aquitania went on an ambitious 40-day cruise out of New York. She called in many ports, including Bermuda, Rio, and Trinidad. 
Tickets for this long cruise started at $495 per passenger. A logistical challenge, no doubt, as evidenced by the fact that the 40-day cruise lasted for 41 days, but it was so successful that Cunard scheduled another one for the following year. But by 1939, Aquitania was nearing the end of her life expectancy. She was showing signs of age, ranging from large structural cracks near her bow to just being old-fashioned by virtue of the fact that her keel was laid down in 1911. Despite these realities, the other reality was that Cunard White Star, recently formed as part of the merger between the two rival companies, needed Aquitania for the time being. Berengaria, Majestic, Olympic, Mauritania, Homeric were all out of service. Cunard White Star had other ships, but as far as large express liners, they were more or less down to the new Queen Mary and the very old Aquitania. Cunard White Star sorely needed a new express liner, but Queen Elizabeth just wasn't ready yet. And when World War II commenced in September 1939, pulling Aquitania out of service was suddenly out of the question, even as Queen Elizabeth neared completion. World War II was destined to give Aquitania a new breath of life and the chance for further glory. She was eastbound for Southampton when Germany was amassing troops at the Polish border. War was imminent. Aquitania's crew blocked out portholes, windows, and painted the superstructure gray mid-voyage, and put the ship on a zigzag course for her own protection. Cunard did not cancel the return trip to New York, and Americans flocked to Aquitania, one of the few ships making the trip, in order to escape the inevitable crisis in Europe. The Consul General of the American Embassy in London boarded Aquitania, and gathered the American passengers in the lounge to deliver a stark message. Their safety could not be guaranteed, as Aquitania was a British ship. Despite the warning, most stayed on board. Aquitania made the voyage safely, though, and upon returning to England, was requisitioned for service once again. Aquitania began the Second World War by carrying Canadian troops from Halifax to Europe. When she was done with that, she moved to Australia to begin moving troops from down under. She often traveled alone rather than in convoy because her high speed was her best defense against enemy submarines. Aquitania escaped the grip of death in June 1941 when she sailed out of Wellington Harbor in New Zealand. Two nights earlier, a German mine layer dropped 10 magnetic mines at the entrance of the harbor, intending to sink the ships waiting in the harbor, but Aquitania in particular. When Aquitania sailed out of the harbor, she somehow evaded, unknowingly, the death traps waiting beneath the surface. The World War II troop transports were infamous for being packed to the brim, and Aquitania was no exception. These voyages were not for the claustrophobic, although these troops wouldn't have had much choice. This is part of the reason she was able to carry more than 334,000 troops during the war. Although she did not get the recognition that Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth did during World War II, Aquitania more than did her part and earned the accolade of having served in both world wars. As the war ended, Aquitania's age was impossible to ignore. Although she was returned to her civilian form, her future was anything but secure. She spent time returning people to Canada, including English war brides who found Canadian husbands, and she re-entered commercial service, but she was set to be surveyed by engineers in November 1949. The conclusion of the survey was, unsurprisingly, that keeping the last four funnel liner in the world in service would be a costly proposition and Cunard simply decided that they were not willing to take the financial hit. It was the end of the line for Aquitania, and as the last of her kind, it was also the end of an era. Those of you who have been following this channel for a while might know that my very first video was on Aquitania. It was the pilot episode, so to speak, and simply put, it isn't up to par with my current content. I am revisiting this video both because I wanted to replace the lower quality video from two years ago, and because I have a new perspective on Aquitania. At the end of my first video, I acknowledged that I did not find Aquitania particularly beautiful, despite her nickname, the ship Beautiful. I have to say that I have come to love the ship, even though she might not project the grace of her contemporaries from the outside. This ship is a wonder of design, style, and practicality, and I hope that this updated video about her does more justice than my first. To everyone who has stuck with this channel from the beginning, thank you for your support. And to those of you who have joined along the way, welcome aboard. <laughs>